Well, today we will not be in Mark, the gospel according to Mark. We'll be in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. I know it kind of seems random. It kind of is random, but not too awfully bad. For instance, last time I was preaching, we were in the gospel according to Mark chapter 11, and you remember Jesus was driving out the money changers from the temple, right? Well, many scholars agree that Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 6 sees a heavenly vision in the temple. So there's my connection. That's why I'm preaching it. So Isaiah chapter 6. I love Isaiah chapter 6 for many reasons. I want you to love Isaiah chapter 6. In these verses, God unfolds to us an immensely wonderful vision of who he is in a way that is both shocking and deeply comforting. The Lord our God is good and he is great. His greatness is unsearchable. His goodness is incomparable. God wants his people to behold and marvel at the glory of his greatness and his goodness. He wants his people to be shaped by who he is. That's really, that's, that's what I'm driving at. God wants us to be shaped by who he is. And that's exactly what happens to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 in this passage. This is exactly how the Lord has used these verses for me. As I see how the Lord, his glory, his greatness, his goodness, radically shapes Isaiah, the Lord used the same text to radically shape me. And I'm praying that God will do the same for you. And also, my friends, before I read the text and pray, I need to remind you something very important. We at Pearl Street Reformed Baptist Church, exist to treasure Jesus Christ. We have been created, we have been saved, we have been gathered for this very purpose. We exist to treasure the Lord Jesus Christ as supremely valuable and all-satisfying. And therefore, we need the Word of God. We need God's Word to fulfill this very purpose in us, the very purpose for why He created us and saved us and gathered us this morning. Apart from the word of God being taught, heard, believed, and cherished, Jesus, the word in the flesh, will not be treasured, nor will we spread a passion for his glory and for the joy of all peoples. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is this. We have a desperate need. We have a desperate need for God to open our eyes and to awaken in us a true desire for him, a real joy in him. And so we need God to do a work in us that we cannot do for ourselves. Oh, how we need God to wield his word of truth like a scalpel to remove the dullness of our heart, to overcome the wayward and corrupted desires that we stir in our hearts so that he would plant in their place understanding and a God word, a God glorifying desire for him. This is what we need the Lord to do to us if we are to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and worship him from a sincere heart. We need the truth of God's word to act as a lens so that we can more clearly see who God is and what he has done in Christ for us. Which in turn, if we see God and his work more clearly... That will give us all the reason we will ever need to love him supremely and love others sacrificially. My friends, knowing God like this, loving God like this, is in fact the greatest joy that God has designed us to enjoy. Loving God like this, knowing God like this, isn't against our joy. This won't stand in the way of our joy. No, loving God, treasuring his son, glorifying him as supremely valuable is our deepest joy. This is our highest pleasure. So keep this in mind. Keep this in mind as I read to you Isaiah chapter 6, the whole thing. This is the word of the Lord. Isaiah 6 Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, 
I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. The two, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Isaiah, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. And the Lord said, Go and say to this people, the people of Judah, and more specifically, Jerusalem. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And I, Isaiah, said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste, without inhabitant, and houses without people. And the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again. Like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. This is the word of God. Let's now pray and ask for the Lord's help. Heavenly Father, please help me to preach and help us all to humbly listen, to give an honest listen to your word. Lord, help us to seek to understand that which you have intended through your prophet Isaiah. Lord, we we don't want to put things into the text. We want to grab things from the text. We want to understand you according to your word. But this, Lord, is a job too big for me. It's too great for me. I am inadequate at this. Lord, please, by your Spirit, cause me to be faithful to you. Cause me to preach in such a way that it glorifies you and helps all those who hear. Please save the lost. Oh, Lord, may you stir within your people an ever-growing, ever-increasing love for you. May we be a humble people, a self-sacrificing people, a people who seek and strive after a holiness, not in an attempt to save ourselves, but to glorify our Savior. Lord, please help with this. All this I ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's look at verses 1 through 3 in detail. There are five truths. To be honest, there's more truths than five truths, but I'm going to focus on five truths of the first three verses. There are five truths about God that God, through Isaiah, gives to us in Isaiah 6, 1 through 3. So here's truth number one. God is the living God. God is the living God. Look at Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. So Isaiah the king died, but the Lord lives on. It's very significant how Isaiah says it as he says it. According to 2 Chronicles 26, verses 3 through 5, King Uzziah reigned 52 years. And he was a good king, by the way. But 52 years, that's a long one. That's a lot of time. But like all kings before and after King Uzziah, who are merely humans... They will come and they will go, but this is not true of the Lord. Isaiah calls the Lord the everlasting God. 
in Isaiah 40, verse 28. The everlasting rock in Isaiah 26, verse 4. God has always been and always will be. He never had a beginning, and he will never have an end. He didn't come into being. He didn't become who he is because he himself is being eternally and unchangeably, and so he will never go out of being. So since God is never, he has never been created, has no beginning, since he depends on nothing to be who he is, therefore God is, as the old theologians would say, ase, of himself, uncreated, self-sufficient. He is who he is, kind of like the name in Exodus chapter 3 that God gives to Moses. I am who I am. Yahweh. John Piper says it this way. God has always been the living God, and he will, he will be the living God even 10 trillion ages from now when all the puny pot shots against his reality have sunk into the oblivion like BBs at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. God is God, and it doesn't matter what you think about him. If you start with, I think God should be like this, you've already started off wrong. If God exists, he has to exist on my terms. Who says? You? And who are you? Who gave you the standard? Why are you the measuring stick? Why do your thoughts count but not God's thoughts in his word? God is the living God. That's truth one. Truth two, God is sovereign. Look back at verse 1. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. My friends, there's no vision of God and Scripture where God is in heaven doing chores, fixing something that broke, filling out incident reports, making some revisions to his plan that he didn't foresee or determine beforehand. <laughs> Those are jokes. Instead, God is sitting, and he is seated on his throne, giving perfect attention to all the details of his creation. He is authoritatively reigning. He is exercising absolute, omnipotent, sovereign control. He governs. He determines. He brings things from nothing to something. And the throne that the Lord is sitting on, so kids, listen to this. The throne that God is sitting on signifies, it's a symbol of his right to rule and reign. That's a symbol. This is a vision. This is symbolic descriptions of God. God is seated on a throne, but God has no body. How does he sit? If he's omnipresent, which parts, what, is there a part of him that sits? No, God doesn't have parts. He's simple. God is not body, he is spirit, he is immaterial. He doesn't take up residence physically in time and space. So these are symbolic descriptions. His throne signifies that he is in charge. We don't give God authority. We don't give God sovereignty over our lives. He has it whether we like it or not. He, didn't, he doesn't send out a survey to say, do you guys still want me to be who I am? Whether we like it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, God is sovereign. And notice the Lord's throne is high and lifted up. Important descriptions. God's throne is not one among many. Not just one that's at the same height as all the rest. His is higher, it's lifted up, it's exalted. God's throne is higher than all other thrones, which signifies that God has superior power to exercise supreme authority. Guess what? God can do things that you can't do. Shouldn't su surprise us. But it does, doesn't it? God is sovereign. Look what he says about himself in uh, Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. Don't turn there, just listen, actually. Listen to what the Lord says. The Lord says, I am God, and there is no other. 
If you didn't catch that, he's going to say it again. I am God and there is none like me. My counsel shall stand. What I have determined, what I have willed, will stand. And I will accomplish all, not some, all my purpose. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, I have it pleased me to will this, and I will do it. So God does as he pleases. No one can thwart him from doing what he pleases. No one can stop God from accomplishing all that he has purposed to do because God is all-powerful. He holds absolute authority. This ought to comfort you, by the way. I know it's scary to think about because God is so unique and different and transcendent than you, but these differences should comfort you. This should be a comfort, a refuge, right? His sovereignty, his absolute control should, should comfort your soul because he's omnipotent. No one can rival or contend against his power because he is authoritative. God rules and reigns. And just putting myself in Isaiah's shoes, how humbling and jaw-dropping would it be to behold a vision like this? I mean, he's getting the raw, he's getting a first-hand glimpse at the raw, all-powerful majesty of the Lord as he's showing up for temple. God is the living God. God is sovereign. Point or truth number three. God is full of splendor. The last part of Isaiah 6, 1 says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So the train of God's robe fills the entire temple, meaning that God is a God of unimaginable, incomparable splendor and beauty. The Lord is excessively beautiful. He has such a big train from his robe that it fills everything. I mean, just look at the universe that God created. Consider the innumerable amount of stars the Lord created. We estimate, what is it now, like 400 billion estimated? It's crazy. Ponder the many varieties of, of insects. How many times have you looked at an insect and just said, why? Why, Lord? What about this, the number of different species of fish, just the variety that live in the ocean? Why create so many variations? Why not create just a few different types? Why? Well, because the God who created all of them is lavish and abundant in splendor and beauty, and he wants to display his extravagance. I want to display my fullness. Look, get lost in the universe that I created. My friends, just imagine being in Isaiah's shoes as he is having this vision in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of abundant beauty and loveliness. Abundant beauty and loveliness. God is full of splendor. God is the living God. God is sovereign. God is full of splendor. Truth number four, God is holy. <clears throat> Verses two and three say this. Above him, above the Lord who is seated, stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. There's a lot to unpack here. First, let's consider these, um, what these seraphim, these strange creatures, what they have to say about God. And then we'll consider the seraphim and then uh, look at how they're worshiping the Lord. Look how they're revering God. So these seraphim repeat the word holy, maybe you noticed it, three times to describe the God that they are beholding, that they're in the presence of, and that they are worshiping. Now, I'm guessing that you guys just aren't, you don't happen to be Hebrew scholars. Let me just give you a little insight on this. I read this from another Hebrew scholar. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. Don't take me that way. But in the Hebrew language, in order to intensify, in order to emphasize something to the highest degree, the ancient Hebrews would double the word. They would say the word twice in repetition, in sequence. Like for instance, if it was a deep pit, it would be pit pit. If it was pure gold, it was gold gold. 
Like in Genesis uh, chapter 2, you shall surely die. That's die, die. So to the highest degree is two times. We double it. But here, this is the only place in all the Hebrew scriptures where your word is repeated three times to convey the magnitude of its quality. God isn't just holy, holy. These seraphim repeat the word holy three times as if to say that God is holy beyond the highest degree and intensity imaginable. This is a category beyond all categories. The magnitude of God's holiness is far beyond anyone's ability to comprehend, let alone put into words. Basically, the seraphim are they're finding out that there is a limit to language when describing God. Language becomes useless when trying to describe God because he's holy, holy, holy. How else can I put it? I don't know how to say it. He's, if you think of holy, just try to uh, multiply that by infinity. Good luck. It's, it's, it's almost, it's, um, it's supposed to make us feel small. He's holy, holy, holy. Now, what is holy? What is holiness? What's the word holy mean? Well, its most basic meaning is separation and devotion to God. Like God would separate vessels for certain uh, functions in the tabernacle or temple. These vessels are holy, not meaning that they're morally pure, meaning they have a special purpose. These are for specifically duties within the tabernacle or temple. Now, here's the, uh, here's the wonderful perplexity of holiness in regards to God. What is God separated from to be devoted to himself? Since he is God, he is separated from all that is not God. That's what it means to be God. So theologians and Hebrew scholars and even New Testament scholars, here's what they have to say about this. They say, we should consider holy and holiness when it's referring to God as infinitely unique superlativeness. Infinitely unique superlativeness. I understand, right? Big word. But I'm not going to leave it at that. So this is to say that God, if you were to say that God's love is holy, right, For it to be an infinitely unique superlativeness of God, that means that God's love is infinitely beyond and better and unique to all other loves. To say that God's justice is holy means that God's justice is infinitely beyond and better and unique to any other justice. Therefore, those seraphim that Isaiah heard saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, They mean that God is infinitely beyond and better and unique to anyone and everything else three times over, thrice. He is not holy because he keeps the rules. No, 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 no. He wrote the rules, and therefore he is holy. He is infinitely beyond and better and unique than anyone and everything because of who he is, not what he does. God's God's a standard unto himself. So holiness isn't just his moral purity. It's his transcendent majesty. So don't, don't just think of someone doing something right. Someone meeting the standard. This is beyond this. This is he is the standard. So there's, here's a good way to put it maybe. God is utterly one of a kind. You can't find someone like him. Everything else is just maybe holy, but it's not holy, holy, holy. I mean, even these seraphim, these creatures that have three pairs of wings who haven't sinned a day in their life, these people who, these, not people, these angels, these burning ones who haven't sinned, they're holy, but when they look at the Lord, they say, Holy, holy, holy. Sinless angels say that. So, God is a being of excellence and infinite value. Now, if we're going to study the ones revering God, those seraphim, I've already said that these are strange creatures to us. 
their name means, seraphim means burning ones. What are they burning with? Well, they're burning with the white-hot adoration and worship of God. They're continually worshiping God. These are mighty creatures. How do I know that they're mighty? When they speak, the temple shakes. Look at verse 4. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. The him there would be one of the seraphim. And yet, these mighty seraphim, as great and as good as they are, feel unworthy to look upon the Lord, let alone leave their feet exposed. Think about that. These sinless angels hide themselves in holy fear and reverence at the beauty and holiness of God, their creator. God is that holy. He's that much better. It's not just a better in degree. It's a better in kind, right? He's so unique that even sinless, perfect creatures are unworthy to look upon the Lord as they worship him. Those who can make the sanctuary tremble at their voice. They shudder in holy fear in the presence of the Lord. That ought to give you goosebumps. Angels, beings like that, they tremble. Beings that can make the earthly tent, the earthly tabernacle, the earthly temple shudder, they shudder when they're worshiping the Lord. God is holy, amen? Truth number five, God is glorious. What does this mean? Well, look at Isaiah 6, 3 one more time. Let's finish it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So God is glorious, and his creation is full of his glory, meaning his creation is full of signs, index fingers pointing to his glory. That's what that means, right? He has all these pointers that point to him as, look at this, this is glorious. That's what it means when it says, the whole earth is full of his glory. The glory of God is the manifestation of God's holiness. If God's holiness is God being infinitely beyond and better and unique to anyone and everything three times over, then God's glory is that put on display. It's God's holiness gone public. In other words, God's holiness is the incomparable perfection of, of God. And therefore, God's glory is God making his incomparable perfection known and public to us. When God shows himself to be holy to you and me, we see glory. Now, the word in Hebrew for glory is kavod, which means heaviness. It means weight. And back in that day, weight or heaviness was basically equivalent to worth and value. That's why they had balances to weigh things, to see how much things were. So God is infinitely heavy, meaning he's infinitely he has infinite worth of supreme value. So, God causes his holiness to be perceived by us. Then we become gripped by God's worth, and our finite minds and souls will try to come to terms with infinite weight, infinite worth of God. So, when the Bible speaks of, act, of the act of glorifying God. The act of glorifying God is not giving something to God that he doesn't have already. The act of glorifying God isn't that. Instead, glorifying God is prizing, prizing, and praising what God is full of. Glory, worth, value. You see? So don't think of glorify as beautify. To beautify something is to improve it and make it look better than it really is. You can't beautify God because God is full of glory. He's full of beauty. You can glorify God, though. You can ascribe to God praise for his incomparable perfections and his fullness of glory. So, let's get this right. God is the living God. God is sovereign. God is full of splendor. God is holy, holy, holy. And God is glorious. My question, what would you do if you encountered the living God as Isaiah did? 
I'll answer for you. You would act just like Isaiah. If this were to happen to you, you would do exactly what Isaiah did. You would respond as Isaiah did. You would tremble. You would pronounce judgment on yourself. And then you would volunteer to do whatever the Lord wants you to do. That's what Isaiah did. Isaiah trembled. He pronounced, whoa, judgment on himself. I am undone. Because the moment that Isaiah truly saw the Lord was the same moment that Isaiah truly understood himself. The moment Isaiah encountered the living God, he almost dropped dead. The moment Isaiah experienced God's sovereignty and splendor, right, he was humbled by his ugliness and insignificance. The moment Isaiah beheld the Lord's holiness, all Isaiah could see in himself was sin. The moment that Isaiah experienced the glory of God was the moment when he rightly perceived his unworthiness of God. And why, what's up with the lips, right? I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. What is that? Well, as tradition would say, Isaiah was royalty, meaning Isaiah was trained really well about how to talk in public. So Isaiah is picking the best part of him, his ability, his ability to make a speech, to turn a phrase in front of people, and he's saying, this is unclean. The most clean part of me is unclean. That's what it means. Is that not wonderful? After seeing God like this, he thinks, who am I? I'm, I, I'm toast. I've seen the king, the Lord of hosts. I realize who I am now. Even the best part of me deserves punishment because it's sinful, it's wicked. I used my tongue for all different types of things that God says don't do. Don't speak like this, Isaiah. But I do it anyways. My friends, when the reality and glory and holiness of God came to bear on Isaiah's mind and heart, it completely re-engineered Isaiah's view of himself. When he got a true glimpse of God, it re-engineered his view of self, Isaiah's view of self, his sin, his past, his present, his future, Everything about Isaiah was rearranged and reordered. Like how Tim Keller put it, every single place where God comes down in the scriptures, there is an earthquake because of the glory of God. When God came down on Mount Sinai, the mountain trembled violently, it says in Exodus. When he came down on the day of Pentecost, the upper room shook violently because God's glory is ultimate. Compared to God, Everything else has no weight. And whenever God's reality comes down, everything else shakes. There's a quaking. There is a glory quaking, so to say. And this is what happens, happened to Isaiah. You see, before this vision, God was just a concept to Isaiah. But by this vision, God became a reality. And what's the difference between concept and reality? Tim Keller says, I'll tell you. It's all a matter of glory, all a matter of weight. God as a concept is lighter than you. When you bring God as a concept into your life, you can shape it. It doesn't shape you. It doesn't move you. It doesn't change you. You can move it. You can change it. God as a concept doesn't change your beliefs. It just fits in with your existing beliefs. But God as a reality is heavier than your beliefs. And therefore, he can't just fit in with them. He defines them. God, as a concept, will fail to shape your agenda and your goals. I mean, how many people in your life do you know that, right, they got real religious because things got tough. They had all these goals and all these agendas that they need God's help with. God as a concept just fits into your agenda. But God as a reality is heavier. He's more important than your agenda, and thereby God becomes your agenda. When God as a reality comes down into your life, things give way because of his glory. You quake, you are changed in beliefs and agenda. I mean, do you, are you beginning to see what Keller is talking about here? Tim Keller. Is God just a concept 
to you. You know, <clears throat> he's just like a softball that you toss back and forth in your mind. You give about as much attention to him as you do the color of your carpet at home. Or has God shown up in your life as a reality? Has God rearranged you? Are you re-engineered? Are you reordered because of him? Now, here's what happened after God became a reality to Isaiah. There's this sequence of events as, that happened as a result, as an outcome, as a consequence when God became a reality to Isaiah. Isaiah was gripped by the seriousness of his sin. He realized the punishment that his sin deserved. But God forgave Isaiah's sin, removed his punishment. Remember the whole the symbolic description of the angel couldn't touch the burning coal, but he could pick it up with tongs from the altar. Altar, what is that supposed to re represent? Well, sacrifice. Who's the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world? Jesus Christ. Right? So this symbolic vision is there is a sacrifice that's able to cancel his debt. There is a substitute who's able to make satisfaction on his behalf. So, though he sees God for who he is, he sees himself as sinful. And he thinks, man, I deserve punishment for sinning against this kind of God. But then God forgives him. He removes Isaiah's punishment permanently. And as a result of the great forgiveness of God, Isaiah, what does he want to do? He wants to serve the Lord who forgave him. But how do we get here? How do we get to where Isaiah is like, I want to be a minister. I want to serve you, Lord. I want, I want to do what you want me to do toward these people. Because the Lord commissioned Isaiah as a prophet and as a messenger to God's people, Judah and Jerusalem. Do you see, what, do you see how, we, how Isaiah got to where he went? His view of God was radically changed. His view of himself was radically changed because his view of sin was radically changed. And then he saw accurately what he deserves. And then all of a sudden, God's forgiveness became precious to him. Precious to him. And then once God forgave him, once God gave him this free gift that he could never pay for or earn or work for or perform for, Isaiah says, I want to serve you. A right view of God leads to a right view of yourself and your sin, which leads to a right view of God's judgment and God's forgiveness, which leads to a right view of service and ministry. So, if you struggle to serve, what's the root of that? There's something, there's something tainted in your view of God. When you don't cherish God's forgiveness, what's the root of that? You don't see God clearly, so you don't see your sin clearly, and then you don't see your punishment clearly, and then God's forgiveness is, eh, kind of impressive, but not really. Right? My point is this. Those whom God has moved into their life as a reality, they view God as unspeakably great and good. They view their sin as terrible and serious. They view God's forgiveness as amazing and undeserved, and they give themselves to minister to others with the word of God for the sake of God's glorious name. That's what happened here. And we see this happen time and time and time again. Think about Moses in the burning bush. What about that vision? What about Jeremiah? What about any of the prophets? What about the time when Peter's out in the boat and Jesus performs a miracle right in his presence? And what does Peter do? Depart from me, for I'm a man of great wickedness, Lord. Same thing. The same kind of response all throughout the scriptures. Is this you? Is this you? Is this an honest description of the people of Pearl Street Reformed Baptist Church? I mean, do you see how your view of God shapes your view of everything else? These things are connected. These aren't marbles in a bag. These are grapes on a vine. They either grow together or they perish together. Do you see what happens when you view God and you trust God as he has revealed himself to be through his word? Let's look at Isaiah. Is it apparent 
where your, pers- your own personal change must start, where my personal change must start, where this, this church's mutual change must start. All God-glorifying change must start with God as revealed in his word. That's where it all starts. Since God is the living God, since God is sovereign, since God is full of splendor, since God is holy, and since God is glorious, my friends, God is worthy of all your interest, your attention, your admiration, your trust, your love, your enjoyment, over and above all other realities in this universe. Leads me to think about something I heard John Piper say once. He said, It is a cosmic outrage billions of times over that God is ignored, treated as insignificant, questioned, criticized, treated as virtually nothing, and given less thought than the carpet in people's houses. That's a cosmic outrage billions of times over. And he's right. This is why it is amazing that God loves us. We don't give God a reason to love us. He just loves us because he is love. And look how he displays his love. He sent his only begotten son, his eternal son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he sacrificed his son to remove our sin, to remove all the barriers that we put up between us and God. The Lord Jesus Christ, God of very God, in the flesh, came and took our penalty in our place as our substitute and our Savior. Why? So that we can be saved And why does he want to save us? So that we would fully and forever enjoy what is most enjoyable, God. This isn't simply for his glory, it's for your joy, because God's glory is your joy. And to add to how amazing this is, do you know what the Apostle John said about Isaiah 6 in the Gospel according to John? Well, After quoting Isaiah 6, verse 10, John says in John 12, 41, look this up later, John 12, 41, these things Isaiah said because he, that he is Isaiah, he saw his glory. And in context, the his there is Jesus. Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and spoke of Jesus. So who was he beholding in that vision? The Lord Jesus Christ. Which means Jesus is the living God. Jesus is the one sitting on his throne, lofty and exalted. Jesus is the sovereign God who is full of splendor, holiness, and glory. Jesus, in a sense, left his throne to become a man. He condescended for us, taking the form of a servant. He became a servant for us. He took on a real human nature, and he did this to be slaughtered for the sin of his people. To bear his own wrath, which we deserve, not him. And Jesus died and rose again, securing eternal life for all who would believe and repent, who would turn turn to him and trust in him. So that's, that's my invitation to all of you. Young and old, guest and faithful member, If God is simply a concept to you, look at Jesus Christ. I know you probably want, I know you want maybe some watertight arguments, but maybe God has forgiven us a watertight person. Look at Jesus and behold all his glory through his word and turn to him. Repent, trust in him by faith, and you will be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Please cause your word to land upon our hearts with transforming effect. It's not enough, Lord, for us to simply view you as a concept. But Lord, we want the reality of you to fall upon our hearts. We want to be shaped by the weight of your glory. So give humble and repentant hearts to the lost, to the indifferent, to the hardened, to the confused. Bring them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And Lord, please refresh the hearts of your saints, of your believers. Lord, shake us awake. Fix our eyes upon Christ once again that we may rejoice in our Savior and repent and live for his glory. All glory be to your name in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Mine are days that God has numbered. I was made to walk with Him. Yet I look for worldly treasure and forsake the King of Kings. Mine is hope in my Redeemer. Though